What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Clark Tank. Uh, but yeah, this week there's a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, we've got there was the Steam trading chart, trading card change. There's Lars's Steam profit, which he announced this week, which I have been doing with him for I don't know how long we've been doing it, Lars. <laughs> three, three, four months. Uh, and also thinking about that, that Steam profit actually made me realize something that we could possibly do to get a better sense of what is, what is selling well on PlayStation, uh, which we'll talk about. And then Dead Cells, and there's all kinds of stuff going on in the charts. New, Lots of new games doing really well, so I'm excited to get to that. Even even older ones like Hollow Knight coming back and getting near the top with no sale going on. So I'm curious to see what's up with that. We'll see on Steam Spy if maybe it's um, a bunch of people have been playing it on Twitch or YouTube or, or what it is, but we'll see if we can figure it out. And let's start out with the changes to Steam trading cards. So. Uh, Valve posted this publicly on the Steam blog. So yeah, the, the changes to Steam trading cards. Uh, so I guess ever since Greenlight, it seems like Valve has been fighting a battle with people who are trying to scam uh, the system in order to make money. And the way that they do it is they put up some video uh, that gets them greenlit, however they do it. Or you know maybe even they game the Greenlight system, which people have been doing for sure. Uh, and then once the game is greenlit and they launch it, they add trading cards to it, and then they produce tens of thousands of of keys, uh, Steam keys for it, and then they give them to bot accounts, and then they use those bot accounts to collect the trading cards, and then they sell the trading cards for money. Um, and so I guess that that is probably <laughs> slightly easier than actually making a video game to make money. Like, that's, that's a way that you can... Um, farm some some money out of the Steam ecosystem and they've been fighting a battle trying to prevent that sort of thing so it sounds like what they're doing now is uh, making it so that before a game is allowed to drop trading cards it has to pass some kind of heuristic I think they what do they call it down below a confidence metric so they're they're basing it on all different kinds of uh, information that uh, Steam itself has. So they were saying that, you know, green light is kind of a way of preventing this sort of thing, but obviously it's not robust enough, so people are still getting through. But they're saying once a game is on Steam, they have so much more information about it than just upvotes. Um, they can actually see how many people are going to the page and how many people are playing it, uh, where are people coming from to find it, you know, how many people have bought it, uh, you know, and at what time and things like that. They have a, and are people doing things in the community or the community posts? They have a lot of different metrics that they can look at to see if something is kind of fake. Um, and so they use that to come up with a confidence metric that will decide whether or not this game should be allowed to have trading cards. Uh, and I imagine for most games that sell reasonably well, it'll be pretty quick that, you know, if you're getting into the top charts, uh, your trading cards are probably going to be activated pretty darn fast because how are they going to get a scam game into the top charts? If they can do that, then they don't need to be scamming trading cards to make money. They just sell games legitimately, right? So uh, so I don't think that this will actually affect most people who are legit, which is, which is good. Uh, and hopefully we'll <clears throat> stop some of those non-games from succeeding on Steam. Uh, Strax saying, I'm amazed by the fact that the demand for trading cards is so high. Yeah, I'm also surprised because... <clears throat> I could see that people want trading cards for real games. Uh, people would buy trading cards for games that they like to complete the set and to make badges and whatever. But why would you do that for a game you don't care about? Who is even buying those trading cards for these fake games in the first place? That's uh, one part of it I don't understand. But uh, it's interesting to hear what's going on behind the, s the scenes at, uh, at, at Valve. Oh, Quixote is saying cards give levels, and levels give Steam features. Ah, yeah, so I guess people might be willing to buy just any um, any card whatsoever in order to, to level up. That's true. Oh, yeah, and you can get gems. That's true. You can convert cards to gems. I forgot about that whole thing. As you can see, I don't really use trading cards too much myself, but, uh, but yeah, it makes sense. So uh, interesting that we get this behind-the-scenes look at what's going on at Steam, and at, at the... Um, at the bottom, they say next we're going to talk about the Steam Direct publishing fee, which will be, that will be big news that definitely will affect us and everybody. So, uh, so yeah, that's it for this on the Steam front. And now let's talk about Steam Profit. So what Steam Profit is, is uh, Lars created it 
few months ago and I was in one of the first groups to be doing it with him kind of privately and what it is is every week we take a look at the games that are coming out that week um, because you can see if you look at upcoming releases if a game has actually set their release date you can see you know when it's coming out and unfortunately not all games will do that some games will just like release and and uh, we wouldn't have covered it in Steam Profit because they didn't by the previous Sunday have their release date set so yeah we, we definitely miss some games this way uh, but basically on Sundays we would take a look at the games that are coming out the next week and we were originally picking one game per day that we thought would do the best um, but now we're actually changed we've changed it a bit and we're just picking like five per week uh, because sometimes on a single day there are like two or three games that are really good and then on other days it's just it's just total garbage so you would rather you know move your picks from one day to to another um, and then uh, a month later we see we take the the lower bound of on steam spy the um, players total and the reason why we use players instead of owners is because sometimes there's if somebody's giving away a bunch of keys uh, in a bundle or something like that, you will often get far lower players than owners. So uh, giveaways tend to cause that sort of discrepancy. So if you're looking at the number of players, it's usually closer to the real value of you know people who paid for the game. So you take the lower bound of players and multiply it by the lowest price in the launch window. And then that gives you like a super rough estimate for how well that game did in its first month. Um, and so what we're trying to do with Steam Profit is see how good we are at um, picking these, um, picking the winners. And often we would have weeks where we all pick the same things uh, because, I don't know, it just seemed really obvious to us. But even though we all pick the same things, there are weeks like that where we were wrong. <laughs> so it, it seemed like, you know, it's clear that this game and this game and this game are going to be the best sellers this week. And uh, despite our consensus, we were still often wrong. Steam Profit is pretty darn interesting uh, and you guys can actually sign up for it yourself and join a Steam Profit League and see how well you do. Uh, it is it is interesting and difficult and you will learn a lot, uh, but I think it requires a fair amount of time invested. Uh, but yeah, a few things about that, you know, I, I, a few thoughts I have about Steam Profit. One is that it really helps to teach you the difference between trailers you know and what you see on the store page and the actual game because sometimes you'll see a game that looks like a sure thing you're like yeah this is this is exactly the type of thing that the steam audience likes this trailer is really good and catchy and you know gets people excited right away uh, and then the game just totally flops and you check afterwards uh, after launch and to try and find out why and there's you know tons of negative reviews and it's got bugs or it's got all kinds of um, you know, unbalanced gameplay and things like that. And you just, you can't see that from a trailer. It makes it, it makes it hard to, uh, hard to estimate how well a game is going to do if you haven't made it yourself, if you don't know like what quality is, quality it is, or if you haven't played it in advance. Uh, and on the other side, sometimes there are games that just look bad and, uh, yet they go on to do quite well, like Sim Airport, which we played on the Clark Tank a while ago. I don't think it's the best looking game around. Um, but it, uh, you know, it did quite well. Although actually I think we did pick it. Um, I think most of us did pick it in the Steam Profit League just because it was a, a sim game and may also have been up against weaker competition that week. But, uh, but yeah, there are, there are games that just come out of nowhere and surprise you. Like this week, uh, what's it called? Ravenfield, I believe, which we'll see in the charts. It's a weird one and I would not have expected it to do so well. So, um, yeah, you learn how difficult it is for, for players to guess, you know, is this a good game? Is this something I should be spending my money on just based on a uh, store page? Uh, a lot of it happens kind of after, um, once you see, you know, what people, what the reviews are for the game, uh, if people are liking it or finding bugs and, and whatnot. So, so we've never been able to see what sells well on PlayStation or Xbox or Nintendo. On, on mobile, there are kind of ways to see what's selling well, but, uh, Mobile is a whole other can of worms. <clears throat> it feels quite distinct from what sells well on console and on PC, so I'm not sure it's worthwhile for us to try and analyze that. But I think that there's a way that we could do it for uh, PlayStation and maybe even Xbox. So 
Remember the box lighter method of of estimating sales on Steam? That's uh, Mike Boxlighter, who is a game developer, and he made he worked on Secret Hitler, that that board game that had a successful Kickstarter, and all kinds of other games. He's just a cool dude in general. Uh, he was the one who first realized that you could estimate sales on Steam. This was before Steam Spy existed by looking at the total number of reviews and multiplying by about fifty. It's Good enough for getting you a ballpark uh, figure. It won't get you the exact number of units, that's for sure. But when you're trying to figure out what are the trends, what's the zeitgeist and stuff like that, you just want the ballpark zeitgeist. Uh, that's enough for our purposes anyway. Yeah, the, I cannot comment on exact sales figures, of course. Uh, there's NDAs in place that prevent devs from commenting on certain uh, you know, specific sales figures for certain platforms. But what I can say is I've talked to some other indies and it seems like the box lighter method works for Sony platforms for, for this number. I think that wraps up the Steam Profit discussion. Now, we're gonna be playing Dead Cells a little bit later, but first we have to do our homework and check out the Steam Top 50. And man, there is some interesting stuff going on this week. First of all, last I checked yesterday, Pl Player Unknown's Battlegrounds was number one, and now Dota is number one. Uh, did they just have some event? I saw some people complaining on Twitter that they just like drastically changed some characters or something, but I've never played Dota, so I don't totally understand it. Um, but yeah, I think that they maybe had an update. Um, so that would, uh, that would explain why it's at the top of the charts. Battlegrounds is just a uh, freaking juggernaut. And CSGO, of course, and King of the Kill, We've been talking recently about these games that are kind of like high stress shooters where, you know, you don't respawn and where, you know, every every action is very important as as opposed to, you know, other games like Overwatch and whatnot that are kind of more run and gun, less tense, more about, um, you know, just straight up, straight up skill, not as much about strategy. Of course, there's definitely strategy in Overwatch as well, but these, these games, I think, um, take it to a different level. So it'd be interesting to see if we get more and more of those types of games camping out in the top charts. It's like, look at these, man. And it's funny that King of the Kill, it was not doing as well until the last few months or whatever. And now that Battlegrounds is here, it's like cemented near the top. I wonder if it's in part because of Battlegrounds. If people are like interested in this style of gameplay, they might go play King of the Kill just for that kind of gameplay, but a, a different take on it, right? So. Um, and City Skylines just put out a DLC, so uh, City Skylines is is a, a huge seller. So anytime they put out a DLC, it's going to be it's going to be in the charts for sure. And now Oxygen not included by my friends over at Clay. I was fortunate enough to get to play this game early in development, and I like it a lot. I think you should check it out if you're into sim games at all. <clears throat> Let's watch the trailer. And uh, it is selling extremely well, and it was it was actually for sale on Steam before its official launch. Uh, one of the first games to do a kind of oh I haven't seen this animated part of the trailer yet. One of the first games to do uh, a kind of I don't know what you call it, like a. a Shadow launch. There's, there's a word for it that I'm missing, but anyway, oxygen not included. I think I I expected when I first played it that it would sell extremely well because the the sim genre uh, does very well on Steam. Obviously, games like RimWorld um, just kicking butt, and the fact that a game like Dwarf Fortress allows Tarn, the the creator of it, to make a living based solely on donations. I think shows that there is a massive demand for sim type games, uh, you know, donations and it's super ask, it's just ASCII art and it's really hard to get into and stuff and yet it still, um, you know, makes enough money for, for Tarn to keep going. So I think it shows that there is a massive demand for sim games. Uh, I would definitely recommend if you're interested in sim games that you consider making one. Sim games are hard to make is the problem. Uh, I've made one or two and they are tough. Uh, it's scary to make them because you don't know until it's fun if it's ever going to be fun. <laughs> you're like adding systems, you're like maybe this will do it, maybe this will do it. 
uh, and you don't know until you get there, and then eventually you're like, oh, it's actually fun now, thank God. Because because you could have been working on it for years and just never found the fun. Uh, but of course, you can analyze other sim games and try to figure out like what are the common elements and what is it that makes them fun, but that still doesn't guarantee that yours is going to be fun unless you do something almost exactly the same as another sim game. So, And also the graphics, you know, everything beyond the game design is i would say easier uh obviously oxygen not included has very good very nice graphics and audio and all of that but look dwarf fortress rimworld they're not especially good looking games really uh and they still sell very well so uh if you're a lone dev and you don't have an artist or you're not an artist yourself then sim games man it's a it's a genre that's that's viable for solo indies so uh, Dragon Ball's universe is up here because it's on sale. Rocket League's perennial, it's always hanging around. King of Fighters is up here because it's on sale. Uh, the, what? Pre-order is twenty percent off, so it's coming out in June, and it's twenty percent off pre-order. Crazy. Okay. Wolfenstein is up here because it's on sale. So Dead Cells. Let's check out this trailer for Dead Cells. We're going to be playing this soon. Unlock permanent upgrades. But yeah, just from that trailer alone, I wouldn't expect it to be selling as well as it's... Like, it's... I would expect people to be interested in it because these sorts of dark, roguelike-y, um, combat-focused games seem to be doing well these days. I think if Hollow Knight were more... Um, were more roguelike-y, it would do even better, even though Hollow Knight is, you know, still doing quite well. Uh, all right, so Rainbow Six Siege is perennial, even though it's two years ish old. Now, City Skylines is up here because it's got that DLC, and sometimes it hangs out in the charts anyway. I'm a little surprised to not see it higher. It's 68% off. Uh, Black Ops 3 is in here because it's on sale. Now, Ravenfield, here's the one that we were talking about that most people did not pick on Steam Profit, that's for sure. So yeah, why is this game selling so well? I don't quite understand. Because it, sure, it's like, it's Ravenfield, which I think is maybe a play on Battlefield. Like, it's supposed to be, I don't know what, what the Raven part uh, refers to. But yeah, it certainly looks like programmer art. But I imagine the gameplay must just be really solid. So like, if you can get in all these vehicles and do your usual Battlefield type stuff, but it's, it's cheaper and plays well, it must just be really solid game. It, it says single player. It doesn't even show the multiplayer, because I'm pretty sure it's actually multiplayer, isn't it? It's... it's single player. Wow. Wow, it's doing this well and it's single player. I am shocked. Anyway, we're at Ravenfield now. Prey uh, was, the, was the new hotness uh, last Clark tank, and I'm surprised to see it drop off this much. It's still selling extremely well, but I'm surprised to see it drop off this much after just two weeks because a lot of people talking about it on, on Twitter and a lot of people playing it on Twitch and YouTube and stuff. So, uh, Endless Space is another one of the new games that came out, um, at least launched this week, came out of Early Access. GTA is a little higher this week than the uh, last Clark Tank, I think. TF2 is always in the charts. Uh, Wolfenstein is on sale. Assetto Corsa, so uh, this just came out yesterday, DLC. Call of Duty is on sale. Now, The Surge, this is another new one. New to the charts. What are Rated you about? M for mature. Oh, it's a mature game. But it doesn't have dead or death or darkness in the title. Slower sci-fi Dark Souls. Ah. Uh, yeah, is that what they were going for, Eclipsed? Sci-fi Dark Souls. Yeah, well, that's a, a reasonable thing to try to make. Everybody likes Dark Souls, right? So put Dark Souls in a different setting. Rated it's M doing mature. reasonably well, but yeah, I guess the, the ratings for it are not super high, so... Maybe it's not quite as good as Dark Souls. Now, Gungeon's up here because it's on sale. Shadow Warrior's on sale. Call of Duty's on sale. Wolf Among Us on sale. Call of Duty DLC. Was it on sale? Bro Force is on sale. Now, Hollow Knight. Why are you back in the charts, Hollow Knight? Because I saw earlier in the week that it was like really high in the charts. Let's look and see if a bunch of people started streaming it or YouTubing it or something. Not much going on on Twitch. Not much going on on YouTube. 
It's weird. Donkey's video? All right, Portal Knights. Near Automata still hanging around. Flight Sim World. Uh, Rising Storm 2 Vietnam. Uh, Call of Duty's on sale. City Skylines on sale. War Thunder is perennial. What? Did something happen? Did they have a update? Vega Conflict. We see this one come in and out of the charts every now and then. I wonder if they had an update as well. So, <clears throat> it's free to play games are a little hard to understand sometimes. Divinity is on sale. All right, Euro Truck Simulator. Uh, Call of Duty's on sale. Other Call of Duty's on sale. More Call of Duty. Maybe it was on sale, or maybe it's just getting a bump because all the other ones are on sale. Elder Scrolls membership. Huh. It was in the charts and then dropped suddenly. Something probably happened there. More Call of Duty stuff. Paladins is this free-to-play game that shows up occasionally. Salt and Sanctuary, uh, you know, another kind of indie side-scrolling combat game. Um, Souls-like. Uh, it's in here because it's on sale, but I wonder if also the, the hype around Dead Cells might also be having an effect on Salt and Sanctuary because it's in the same sort of genre, indie Souls-like. Metin 2, it's free to play, never heard of it. All right, Tekken 7. Uh, Shadowverse CCG, so we've talked before about this being kind of like the Hearthstone of Steam. Uh, Witcher, just perennial. Gary's Mod, Gary's Mod. Still selling, still ticking after 10 years. Uh, Call of Duty's on sale for honor. Did this, did this drop out of the charts last week? Yeah, probably did. It had a really strong start, and then lately it's uh, it's faded. Uh, people were complaining about server issues and things like that. I wonder if they, uh, I wonder if they are still having issues. Uh, that was an auto host. You finished your stream three hours ago. Oh, I see. Yeah, I thought it usually would say if it was an auto host though, because yeah, I've been getting hosts from some other folks um, that probably were also auto hosts, but it didn't say it. Confusing. <clears throat> All right, Rust. Rust back in the charts. Interesting. Hotline Miami in the charts because it's on sale. Call of Duty, Hotline Miami 2. There's Shell Shock. We were talking about it. I still I still am shocked by how well this game sells. Uh, we've talked about it on a couple Clark Tanks. Factorial comes up into the charts sometimes. Usually RimWorld's above it, though, when it happens. Arma 3 Jets. That's a DLC. Yeah, well, Arma 3 is usually in the you know, around the bottom of the charts, so <clears throat> it coming out with a DLC, I expect it uh, to be in the charts. Why is Plague Inc. back in the charts briefly? Maybe somebody started playing it. Armor 3 Bundle and Production Lines. So this is made by my pal Cliffski. And when I first heard about this, I was confident that it was going to do well because, hey, look at games like Factorio. Um, and Big Pharma, people really like this sort of optimizing factories type gameplay. Um, so if you do it in a different, you know, with a different theme and, you know, with unique gameplay, with a different style of gameplay, uh, of that, of that same sort of factory gameplay, then I expect it will sell. So, and it is, it is, it's going to go on to make at least low millions of dollars, I think, which is great. Great for Cliff. Another success for him. He's the guy who made Democracy 3, which was a giant, giant hit. Dawn of War. So just still hanging out since its launch a couple of weeks ago. I'm surprised that it's not higher. It's dropped off pretty quickly. It was a pretty, like, noteworthy game. Uh, Path of Exile is usually around here. And Day of Infamy is up here because it's on sale. And Ark. I wonder if they had an update as well. They haven't been in the charts for a little while. Uh, all right. That is the Steam Top 50s. New run. Yeah, I wonder, what are, what are the cells? Dead cells support three languages, English, French, and simplified Chinese. 25% of owner bases from China. Woo. That is interesting. Strack, thank you. Yeah, I think it's, it's so important now to support Chinese. Correct. Was this the Electro Whip? Yeah. Get whipped. Oh, secret. Hey, guy. 
and fill it up one at a time. You now own a health flask you can use at any time. Well, that's nice. What are you? Uh oh, are you a bad dude? Elite. Whoa, you shoot better arrows, I can't duck. Ah, use two elite. The balance in this game is pretty good. Like it, on your second run, it gives you more money so that you quickly get back to kind of a more powerful state. Horizontal turret. You can get turrets. More strength. All right. Die. Yeah, definitely a fun game. The combat is pretty good. It, it feels a lot like... It's funny, it does not look like Risk of Rain at all. Obviously, it looks way better than Risk of Rain. Um, but the combat does feel quite similar. You're, you're rolling around. Um, you're shooting things. You know, there's quite a few projectiles. More projectiles in Risk of Rain. Uh, but just the, the number of different items that you get. Uh, the unlock system and stuff. It feels feels quite similar so it has a good meta game it has a good progression mechanic you know you get some of your gold from your last run so it entices you to keep to keep going and also i feel like i'm gaining more skill i understand these enemies more um i wonder if they have a way of skipping past the first few levels or something because i already feel like those first that first level guys unless i make a mistake they're pretty easy uh i only died in that second level because i i kind of got swarmed and panicked but eventually those guys should be pretty easy and you would never get hit by them either. And Risk of Rain kind of changes it up by giving you semi-randomized. It's not always the same level first and also gets harder as you go. Uh, whereas this, it seems like, you know, the longer you take in Risk of Rain to, to beat a level, the more and more enemies come. That wraps it up for this week's Clark Tank. Hope to see you guys again in two weeks. Thank you all so much for hanging out as usual. It was fun and I learned more because you guys were here. Much appreciated. Uh, but yeah, that's it for now. See you in two weeks. This Clark Tank is over.